What's up, guys? Welcome back to Borderfield Live, the most important sports show on the internet. I'm here with Donovan. And Donovan, your pick, what is your favorite move that happened at the NBA trade deadline? See, there's a lot of moves I like, but I think Victor Oladipo to the Heat for what they gave up was very, very good. The Heat look like a, the Heat have a very dangerous roster right now. They might have a better roster than they did last year. And last year they made the finals. So they're going to be interesting moving forward. Right. They they didn't seem to give up anything. I'm trying to get the exact details pulled up here. That's what I was going after. Yeah, it definitely wasn't much. Is it all the way up here at the top? All right, we'll find it. Oh, here it is. They only gave up uh, Avery Bradley. Ke- I'm not going to try and pronounce that last name. Uh, Kelly Olenek. And then uh, they're just swapping uh, pick rights in 2022. So... And, and, I mean, it was the Nets pick. The Nets are really good now, so it's not like they're giving up a yeah. high-value pick. Yeah, it won't be. It's Yeah, it was definitely strange, but obviously they were – Houston was looking to get rid of him in any fashion, it seems like. Mm-hmm. I mean, Houston should be looking to get rid of everyone. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, time, it's time to burn it down and restart. Yeah, absolutely. It, they're, <laughs> they can't get worse than they are right now. But on the bright side, it looks like that's what the, where they're heading. They're not trying to hold on and not do anything. So, yeah. didn't they just finish up a fourteen game losing streak? Did, was it? Did it get to? I thought it got to seventeen. Did it get to seventeen? Last you I know, checked, it was at thirteen, and then I no, stopped checking might, for a might, second. I might be thinking of the Buffalo Sabers in the NHL right now. I know you're not a hockey <laughs> fan, but they are the where they are the Houston Rockets of the NHL. They haven't won, I don't think, since late January. Uh, I'll watch hockey to watch people hit each other, but that that's about it. All right. Everything enough. moves too fast. Fair enough, fair enough. I played my whole life, so I'm just used to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so we just wanted to go over today just the trade deadline, what happened, who's where now, and, you know, what we think that means for the future of a lot of these teams. Um, we're going to start with Boston up towards you. They are, they are sending Daniel Th- Thies. Thies? Thies? Nice thighs to i was completely wrong to chicago and a three team and a three team trade uh boston's getting moritz wagner luke cornett two young players washington is getting daniel gafford and chandler hutchinson while chicago gets daniel fez thighs troy brown javante green and cash from both washington and boston i think chicago got away with a steal here chicago is definitely a team that you know, they're not a they're not a contender right now. But in terms of the future, they have a really good roster right now. Uh, I was I was really surprised because we're gonna see we're gonna see them pop up again here in a bit. They were buyers all throughout the trade were. deadline, and like that really surprised me for a team currently in tenth place in the Eastern Rost in the Eastern yeah. Conference. The thing is, though, if you if you look at the standings, you know the gap between I think it's third or fourth place to like tenth place is only a couple games, so. Oh, yeah, because fourth place is Charlotte at 22, and yep. then you got the Knicks at 23, Hawks at 22, Heat at 22, Boston at 21, and then Chicago right there at 19. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's there's a lot of moving around to do. We're halfway through the season now at this point. So along with along with the new um, the format this year that they will be playing rounds with the seven through 10 seeds. So. If you're around that 9-10 seed, that's going to be really important towards the end of the season. And, you know, we might not see that again. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think, you know, teams yesterday that you might have not expected to be so aggressive were obviously the best example of that is the Bulls. Um, In terms of Boston, yeah, see, it's surprising to me that they've, you know, they've kind of trended downward this year. Um, Tatum, uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are both, you know, they're on the verge of, you know, being stars in this league if they already mm. aren't. Um, but they have really, I think Danny Age has really failed to put the right team around them. Um, you know, they've been in the past four seasons, they have been to three Eastern Conference finals. Two of those years was, you know, when LeBron was on Cleveland, he, no one else was getting out of the East. Mm-hmm. But you know, they had that Kyrie experiment, went, went, obviously did not work out for them. Right. And with the Gordon Hayward thing this summer, I think they also, uh, this summer, you know, fall, whenever the offseason was, 
Mm -hmm. Uh, They messed that up, I think, too. I think they could have gotten – they could have gotten a sign-in trade with Hayward, but they let him walk for nothing. And, you know, players like him, Terry Rozier, they're playing very well on Charlotte right now. And it kind of makes you wonder what the moves – what moves Danny Ainge, you know, can make to make this team a contender because what I saw yesterday and what I saw this past offseason was all of their rivals got, you know, pretty – all their rivals got better. Obviously, Brooklyn loaded up. Philly, you know, Philly looks as good as they've looked in the past three to four seasons, even with Embiid and Ben, you know, kind of in and out with injuries, but they've still found a way to stay pretty consistent. Um, what, As we've said, Miami, Miami possibly won the whole deadline yesterday. So, you know, those are in the Bucks uh, with getting PJ Tucker and, you know, they already added some pieces this past off season. Um, mm-hmm. All of, you know, Celtics were considered one of those top teams going into the season and they have been, you know, rightfully so the past couple of years, but as those teams get better, they've seemed to have gotten, you know, extremely worse. And for them to not even be over 500, I think uh, is an indictment on Danny Ainge. Um, The thing about Boston though, is I've been, you know, I've lived here my whole life. They are very loyal to their GMs, their coaches, and it's, it, for the most part, it does them more harm than good. Mm-hmm. Um, Danny Ainge to me has not has not done the job up to par. I mean, they have one title, you know, since the eighties, um, and they're not, you know, they're not moving in the right direction right now. And it really makes you wonder, you know, is Brad Stevens going to go? Is Danny Ainge going to go? I think it's going to be a very interesting off season moving forward for them uh, because I don't see this team making a long playoff run. I think you know their ceiling might be the second round depending on, mm. you know, matchups. But it's, it's it's very surprising to me that they've, they've gotten worse, not better. And that's very rare in the NBA when you have not one but two, you know, all-stars in their 20s. So it's going to be interesting to see how that team handles that moving forward. Right, and it is worth noting, like, both of those guys are guys that everyone's keeping an eye on. If Like, they're going to stay in Boston. They're going to stay in Boston. But if, if for any reason they don't, the entire NBA would be glad to sw- to swipe them. Absolutely. And, and so, yeah. it, like, if you're Boston, you have to be on top of getting your management right to make sure that does not happen. In this league, too. In this league today, like, players not happy, they, like, like that, request a trade. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's. I'm not saying I agree with it, but it doesn't matter what I think. It's how it is. So, right. Uh, yeah. And if Danny Ainge isn't the guy to keep Tatum and Brown – they're going to have to find a replacement and you know what they're doing right now is just simply not enough right and then our next big trade the the trade really isn't the part that i found most surprising uh dallas added shooting or added some shooting by picking up jj reddick um they got jj reddick nicolo mealy and then they sent new orleans james johnson and a 2021 second plus some cash I'm more surprised that Dallas didn't actually end up trading Kristaps Porzingis. Yeah. Um, I know I know Mark Cuban went back and forth on yes, he's he's on the trade block. No, he's not. Um I yeah. wrote in an article that he was on a Schrodinger's trade block where he both was and wasn't tradable. Yeah. Um I'm but I am really surprised. I thought they were actually gonna make it happen there at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, you gotta wonder what Porzingis' health status is, you know, maybe mm-hmm. this was other teams backing off a little bit because, you know, we don't know. Porzingis has missed a lot of time, you know, since his main injury in New York. And, you know, teams aren't willing, teams aren't going to be willing to give up that much for a player, you know, who's talented, who's special. Like his talent is special, but, you know, you can't trust his health. You just simply can't. That's the fact. And, whether this was a Mark Cuban decision or maybe they reached out to other teams and, you know, they, Mark Cuban, you know, was wanted too much in return or, you know, they were just iffy on taking him in the first place um, because it's not a talent problem. So, you know, you just got to, at this point, assume that it had something to do with his injury history. And it may be so that he's been in and out of the trade block because, you know, they like him. They like his talent. And when he is healthy, him and Luke are very, very, they play very well together. But at the same time, you know, teams are going to fill 50-50 on it just the way Mark Cuban does. So, you know, simply there probably just wasn't enough time 
to come mm-hmm. up with something. But if you look towards this off season, you know, could be extremely different. He could be out. Yeah, and this with noting, like, I think his injury is one that he could get over. But the problem is the moment he feels even slightly ready to take the field, he throws himself back on the court. And then yeah. he's going to immediately re-injure some knees. Yep. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it sucks to see, but, you know, maybe, hopefully, yeah, you know, hopefully his, you know, his run of bad luck doesn't, you know, come on anymore, but it's, it's understandable why teams, you know, could back off a little bit from that. Right. Um. The, the next trade we had here was the Victor Aladipo trade. We kind of talked about it. They are making themselves ready to go for the playoffs. Um, and then, so this one isn't a trade. It's the lack thereof. Lonzo Ball and Kyle Lowry both staying put. Uh, I kind of want to start with Kyle Lowry. Yeah. Um, a lot of people projected him to the heat, um, but no movement. Toronto yeah. wanted, they wanted the brink struck for him. Yep, they did. And that's just not going to happen. And especially when you're dealing with Pat, Pat Riley and Rob Polinka, two of, you know, more of the intelligent, experienced GMs in this league we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they faced off in the finals last year. But, you know, I, from what I've read, what I saw, you know, um, the Raptors won from the Heat, you know, a lot of their role players and Tyler Harrow and maybe a pick, which is just too much because you can't put – you can't mortgage your whole future into a 35 role. And with the Lakers, you know, I think the Lakers would have done KCP and Schroeder in their first rounder for him. But when they added um, Talon Horton Tucker, who is a lot of people don't know about him, but he's a very, he's very young up and coming star in this Lakers team. uh, They didn't want it. And I, you know, I, I can't blame them at the same time. If Toronto, Toronto might lose them for free now. And it, it weird that, you know, Toronto should have taken what the heat and the Lakers offered. I can understand from both sides that, you know, obviously both sides were playing hardball in this situation, but I think the Raptors are slightly overvaluing Kyle Lowry just because, you know, obviously he's beloved there on that team, Mm -hmm. but you got to look into his age. You got to look into his contract. You know, the smart GMs aren't going to just say, bang, like we'll take the trade. It looks good on paper. You know, they're going to have to put into – you know, they're going to have to consider what they're giving up. And that's just what happened. Right. And it is worth noting, though, that Tor- I think Toronto overall has just, they've flubbed this entire Kyle Lowry situation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we heard, we heard reports last year that DeMar DeRozan's contract, he, he had the player option. He could have left left off season. And he could have, he's going to leave this offseason. He's not staying in San Antonio. Yes. Um, I was surprised that he did this season, but I think COVID yeah. played a nice little role in that. Absolutely. We heard reports that DeMar DeRozan wanted to go back to Toronto. Mm-hmm. That, like, when his contract was done with the Spurs, he was very likely going to go back to Canada. Yep. Without Kyle Lowry, he's not going. Kyle no. Lowry was his reason to go back, and he's not going without him. No. Absolutely not. You know, they were best friends. They had a lot of great runs together on that team. Obviously, it didn't result in championship success, but they had really good – They those Raptors teams had really, really good teams. And, you know, if they stuck it out – I understand, though, why they moved off DeMar, even mm-hmm. if, you know, they had the one-year rental with Kawhi. But, you know, obviously it worked out for them. They won a title. But at the same time, um, if – you're absolutely right. If Kyle Lowry is not on that team this time next year, you're not going to see DeRozan there either. And mm-hmm. it wouldn't shock me if those two try to team up elsewhere. Right. Uh, they're obviously very close, but Toronto's having a very bad year. And, you know, they are, they might be the, you know, with teams, you know, in terms of expectations, they might have been the biggest disaster this year. Um right. So, yeah, they really did botch this and kind of makes you wonder, you know, what is their plan moving forward? And I don't even think they might not even know that at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they're getting close to that point where you need to start blowing it up. Um, I mean, of course, they did. They extended Fred, Fred Van Fleet this last offseason, yeah, which even. really which really surprised me. I didn't think they were going to keep him. Yep. They got rid of Gasol and Siakam. 
I mean, mm-hmm. which also that wasn't surprising to me, but at the same time, you're going to overpay Van Fleet. And then, you know, you're already paying Lowry. You might lose out on him in free agency. I just don't understand. I just don't know what their motive is exactly. And yeah, you're absolutely right. They should be moving towards rebuild rather than, you know, trying to stay contenders because obviously what they have right now is not working out. Right. And then, so the other player that that a lot of people, we we talked about uh, whether or not he'd be traded this year. Lonzo Ball doesn't yeah. end up getting a deal anywhere. Does that say more about Lonzo Ball or the people in need of a point guard? I think Lonzo has, you know, for the past month or so, he's really, really, you know, found his groove on that team. I think he's, I think Magic Johnson said it the other day that he has the highest IQ of a point guard in basketball. And I can see that when I watch him, Uh, you know, I think Lonzo, a lot of the slack Lonzo gets is the, you know, the expectations he had coming into the league, mostly from his father, who was obviously a big mouth, but, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously on top of that being drafted to the Lakers, you know, the magic Johnson comparisons, whatever. But, you know, I think he's found his groove on this team. He's turned into a, you know, a very, a pretty good three point shooter. Um, which is surprising, that, especially after his time in LA. I thought he was never going to get a shot exactly, down. Which, which I think it speaks to more that he had a confidence issue more than a talent issue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, I think he saw what his brother was doing, how special he was playing this year. And maybe that added some extra motivation to him. But I think New Orleans is smart for not letting him go because. I really think they can. I really think he can find a role in a starting role on on this team. Um, I think a player like Zion would love to have Lonzo around. I think those two can be special together. On top of Brandon Ingram, you know, he, Lonzo's not going to get that max superstar contract. But if they can find a way to keep those three pieces on their team, I think they're going to be good for a long time. You got to consider how young they still are. Um, right. So, to me, I think. This was all a New Orleans decision, and I'm honestly glad that they kept him because I think he deserves to stay in New Orleans. I don't think he's, I don't think he deserves to be moved a third, uh, a second time. Um, it's you know, you're moving around from, you, you go to two to three cities in your first three four years in the league, you know, you're not gonna find a groove, mm-hmm. and you know, New or- um, Lonzo has you know gotten comfortable finally, and I think you know there's only room to improve from here. So I'm actually glad New Orleans held on to him. Yeah. It, it told me that the coaching in New Orleans, it's more confident in him now moving forward. Absolutely. They didn't try to force anything. And like you said, that team is super young. And besides Zion, no one on that team is getting a super max contract. Yeah. So they are going to have money to spend. They have a super young roster. They could be legitimate contenders for a very long time if they add another superstar, potentially in this offseason. Absolutely. Zion, I don't think people – people are going to realize very soon how good Zion is because he, he is extreme. He he is very, very good. He's one of the more efficient players already in this league, and he hasn't mm-hmm. even begun to sniff his prime yet. That's the scary part. And if you pair him with a playmaker like Lonzo – that that's a dangerous combination to me right and then so the next trade we got actually surprised me a little bit i'm really surprised rajon rondo going to the clippers in exchange for lou williams going to the hawks the the clippers just traded away the forever sixth man of the year yeah um a lot of people, so I think a lot of the initial people's initial first reactions to this is, uh, you know, they're above the Lakers now. But the thing is, Rondo, Rondo is a great playoff performer, you know, veteran, smart. But you have to take into account who he was with last year. The combination of Rondo and LeBron James's IQ is virtually unstoppable. And on top of, you know, a specimen like Anthony Davis. It's mm-hmm. a different situation with the Clippers. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are not some are not players who, you know, are gonna let Rondo take over, you know, the plays, the you know, running plays in the either in a game or practice. It's two different personalities. I'm gonna be very interested to see, you know, Rondo is a hard worker and he's all he takes this game very serious. And we saw how he helped the Lakers locker room last year. And we saw the disaster that the Clippers were both on and off the court last year. Um, 
it's going to be interesting to see how he group, how he fits in with that team because of what I've been what I've heard what I've seen the past two years it, it, there's been a lot of dysfunction on that team so mm-hmm. I think Rondo will definitely make an impact I just don't think he will have the impact that the same impact he had on the Lakers simply because of the players around him um, in terms of Lou Williams very strange to shore to uh, very strange that they moved on from him in that fashion. At the same time, you know, there was a lot of rumors going around that he was like the main issue of the problems last year in the bubble. Obviously, he had that, he had that, you know, incident with him leaving to go get chicken wings. Yeah, uh, that, that doesn't help. <laughs> uh, he's back in Atlanta now, so you know he can he can go to he can go to that spot all he wants now. But it's it is strange because obviously they. They wanted they were looking to move on from Lou Williams. And when it's just straight up like that, you know, this makes you think that the Clippers have been scheming this, you know, for longer than we think. So um, it's it's definitely going to be strange to see, you know, Rondo fit in with that Clippers team. Um, But I'm not exactly surprised that they moved on from Lou Williams, not because of his talent, but obviously something more was going on that we don't know about yet. And that's why they were willing to move on from, from, you know, simply just for Rondo. So definitely it interesting. Is, it is really weird. We don't get to hear literally everything that happens in the Clippers organization. They yeah. tend to be a little tight-lipped until the offseason. They are. They, exactly. And, you know, their superstar is, you know, you can barely get anything out of them. Kawhi is not, <laughs> you know, he, he, you're not going to find out what's going on. And the only reason they did last year was because they were all in that bubble together. So, you know, mm-hmm. reporters had access, all the reporters had access to all the teams. But, yeah, we're going to find out, depending on what happens with this team this year, we'll probably, you know, if they win the title, we're not going to hear anything about what happened negatively. But anything outside of that, I'm expecting more stories to come out, just like the Doc Rivers team last year. Right, and if you, if you think this team is beating the Lakers, if you think any team is beating a healthy Lakers right now, and, and sure, the Lakers do have some injury problems right yeah. now. You know, Anthony Davis has been in and out of the lineup and that, all year. That is, you know, people have to forget that they they barely had an offseason, this team, the Lakers. Mm-hmm. And when you're with a 36-year-old LeBron, you have an Anthony Davis who, you know, he doesn't stay healthy a lot. But when he's out there, I think the Lakers know what they're doing. I don't think they right. – I'm not – I'm not as drastic as saying they could care less about the regular season, but they know their eyes on the playoffs. And if they have LeBron and Anthony Davis back, that is the, that is their only, that is their only, you know, that they're fine. So I agree with you. Uh, I think people take regular, I think people take LeBron James teams, regular season into account way too often. And Mm -hmm. it always comes back, you know, to prove them wrong in the end. Um, I think a couple East teams are going to be tough, but through the West, it still runs through the Lakers. And, you know, people are putting Clippers, you know, maybe above the Lakers, which I don't understand. But in terms of the Clippers, they didn't even get past the Nuggets last year. And this Nuggets team got better by adding Aaron Gordon yesterday. So, you know, Clippers shouldn't have their eyes set right on the Lakers because look how that happened last year. Right. And you mentioned Aaron Gordon. I'm actually going to find that here. Um, Orlando sold the team yesterday. Yeah, they sold they, they sold it away, which we kind of saw coming. We kind of knew they were they were looking to sell it all and walk away with some cash, start the rebuild process. Yeah, uh, but they they made a lot of teams a lot better. You mentioned Aaron Gordon goes to the goes to the Nuggets. The Nuggets gave away Gary Harris, uh, RJ Hampton, and a first-round pick for yeah. Aaron Gordon and Gary Clark. Aaron Gordon makes that team better, and that is a great – I know earlier we were dishing on the management in Boston, but that's a great move for them. It, absolutely. And, you know, not to say those Nuggets players weren't important or good players, but if that's all you're giving up and you can get a player like Aaron Gordon in return, that's definitely a well-done trade. So – you know, Magic obviously weren't trying to hardball anyone. They wanted their stars and, you know, they wanted their stars out and they were willing to get back, you know, not the bare minimum, but, you know, it wasn't a situation like the Raptors were looking to get everything back. 
-hmm. they were willing to understand that, you know, we can't afford to play hardball. We're trying to go into a quick rebuild mode and that's what they had to do. So, you know, I think obviously Denver executed that trade very well, but I don't think it's right. You know, I don't think Orlando, you know, you can call Orlando a disaster. I think obviously by making these moves, they have some type of plan. And right. even if, you know, similar to the Thunder, all those draft picks they've piled up over the past couple of seasons, even though they're not a playoff team right now, you know, you could argue that they're in better positions than some of these borderline teams that don't have a plan or don't know what they're doing, like we talked about with Boston and Toronto. You know, obviously Boston and Toronto is a better team roster than the Magic right now. That doesn't mean they're better moving forward. And, you know, you can really tell – that's how you can really tell who – you know, who is a, you know, a top GM, a good GM, and then someone who, you know, might not be in that same position last year. And in, in, in a league like the NBA, you can really tell who knows what they're doing and who doesn't. Right. And I, I got a little confused with my names because I was trying to read two different trades here. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron Gordon goes to Denver and then Evan Fournier goes to Boston. Yes. Boston only sends them two second round picks this is one of the best young defenders in the league right now super underrated great perimeter defender yes. and he got he got got for two second round picks yeah um yeah and like you said that they uh, that's obviously the magic's game plan right now is to get as many picks as possible that's what i got and you know they still have you know I don't know who's probably their biggest draw now, Markel Fultz, even though, you know, he's been borderline a bust from what he had. He's obviously improved since he left Philly. I think he found a, like a consistent home in Orlando uh, after, you know, the injury this year sucked for him. But outside of that, I think they're trying to build through the draft. So it is surprising that that's all they got back for a player like that. But at the same time, you know, he his contract expires in a couple months. Um you know, Boston may very well be getting him as a rental. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how not only how, what Orlando does with the picks they got, you know, they could move those two to get someone else. But as of right now, their plan seems to be through draft picks. Boston, on the other hand, it was a great pickup for them, but I just think they have – their problem is, like, they don't – they have too many, you know, similar type players. You know, mm -hmm. they have too many, you know, wing guys, wing wing players who can defend and, you know, hit threes. Um, you know, that's not a long-term, you know, sustainable success, sex, successful plan. So, um, Boston, yeah, they – I'm, I'm still, you know, pretty confused with what they're doing right now. I'll say, like, I had Evan Fournier come into San Antonio – I thought San Antonio was going to give up uh, L.A. and a draft pick or two for yeah. him. They add another defensive player to a young defensive team that they're building in San Antonio. And, like, they have the money to pay him. I yeah. don't know if Boston has the money to pay him. Because they have to be thinking about Marcus Smart and Jason Tatum right now. And don't forget that Kemba Walker is making almost $30 million a year. Yep. Yeah. So, they, are, they have a Tristan Thompson contract. Uh, you know... Again, I don't know what their game plan is right now, but I would be extremely surprised if Kemba is on this roster next year. That's my that's my I think that's my main assumption out of this. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Kemba signing was kind of just an instinct signing from Kyrie leaving. You know, needed an immediate replacement for his position. Kemba's a good player, but he's injury prone and he hasn't lived up to expectations in a city like Boston who obviously has high expectations for all their sports on top of his expensive contract. It just sounds like he's not going to be here for much longer. Right. And then to round out the Orlando trading away their roster, uh, they sent Nikola Vuvicic and yeah. Al uh, Farouk Aminu. Yep. Um, and then uh, to Chicago and Chicago sends him Wendell Carter Jr., Otto Porter and two first round picks for Nikola Vuvicic. Um, again, this is Chicago being a buyer, but they they sold they gave away a lot. They did, but I think they're just trying to build around Zach Levine. And you know, I think Vucevic is one of the more underrated players in this entire league. And a reason that he is underrated in the first place was because of the team he's on. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Bulls don't get a lot of immediate attention right now, but I think they will going forward. 
Zach Levine is a, a very good player, and you can pair him up with a very good, consistent demon, big man like Vujovic. Um, they obviously have a plan moving forward, and this could be a playoff roster, you know, right now, but even even more so next year. Right. Like, um, I think most of these guys that they picked up are still under contract for a year or two. So yeah. they're going to have like, like, that's the thing we said, they're probably gearing up for a playoff run this year. They're probably going to land a seven, six seed. I don't know. Yeah. They got a lot better. They could land a five seed if they wanted. Yeah. Um, the gap and, is so short. And so, but like you said, next year is even bigger for them. If this team is that much better and they have an off season to gel this unit, yeah. And then also maybe pick up one or two more depth players. Chicago could be dangerous. And it, I, it's worth noting that that team is well coached, well managed. Let's see what they do next moving forward. The East has a lot of, you know, teams that aren't ready right now, but will be soon. So mm-hmm. that's, and that's an, I bring, I keep going back to Boston that they need, if they don't act soon, not only have they seen, you know, their top rivals pass them, but they're going to start to see more and more teams pass them. You know, example, like a team like the New York Knicks. Someone said to me, yeah, the Knicks and the Celtics are going to have the same roster this year. I would call you an idiot. <laughs> that's that's what's happening right now. Not mm-hmm. the same roster, same record. So, yeah, I mean, it's not all Boston, but teams like Boston, Toronto, you know, et cetera, Indiana. Um, they're they're seeing teams like Atlanta, the Knicks, um, the Bulls, Charlotte. Charlotte, all these teams that were, you know, lottery teams, they're all playoff teams right now. Right. Like these are like I was just looking at the East here and I'm sitting here going, there are already three really young teams yeah. ahead of Boston. You know, you yeah. have Charlotte, New York, and Atlanta. Um, of course you have Philly, Milwaukee at the top, and Brooklyn up there as well. Yep. Um, like like the East, it, it was only a few years ago when the East was just LeBron's team and then everyone else. Yep. And now it's a bunch of really great, really young teams that only got better yesterday. I'd I, say I, overall, the East only got better yesterday. They did. I think the East, yep, I think the East got better. And, you know, a couple West teams got better. But in terms of, like, these the up-and-coming teams, it's it's – it's jam packed in the east right now. Right. All right, we have another move here and this looks like the last move worth mentioning on my list. Uh we have JaVale McGee is being sent to Denver. Cleveland is picking up Isaiah Hartenson, uh protected 2023rd second and an unprotected 2027 second. Uh what happened to JaVale McGee? He was for the longest time, that guy on whatever yeah. team he's on, and now he's been journeyman around the league. Yes, um, I was. Ver- I was. Um, you know, I was pretty surprised that the Lakers didn't resign him. Um, but obviously, you know, maybe it was his value. Maybe he wanted more. But um, I think this might be more in this instance. This might be more of a Cleveland thing. Mm-hmm. Cleveland, I think. I think Cleveland's a. They're not there yet, but they have they have players that can put them in that same category with the Hawks and all of them, the Bulls. Um, I think I think them getting rid of JaVale McGee, you know, I don't know if it's clearing up cap or, you know, just trying to, you know, restructure some things. But, you know, they have Colin Sexton, Garland, um, Chet, Chetty Osman, you know, some young players that can produce and, you know, we've seen them upset a few teams this year. You know, they beat Brooklyn a couple times. Obviously, right. that's not sustainable, but you can see what they are capable of. Um, I would be very, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm expecting them to move on from Kevin Love this coming mm-hmm. off season. I thought mm-hmm. the past two off seasons he was going to be traded. Um, he has an expensive deal. He's a great player, but I think that's another. I'm surprised that a lot of contenders aren't looking to get him. Because he's a he's still a great player, and I think him being in Cleveland obviously trumps that. But at the same time, you know, um, if, if this could be a win win for both teams, if you could get off that Kevin Love contract, you could clear you up for either draft picks or to get you know sign someone else. And for a contending team, you know whether that be in the East or West, 
Kevin Love would is a great addition, like no matter how you want to put it. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking for I'm that's the main thing I'm trying to you know see what the Cavs are gonna do. Right. Um. You did mention yeah the Cavs have been the Nets a few times this year. They they have little little flashes. They do of high end talent. They just it's not sustainable for them right now. Absolutely. But moving forward, I think it will be. Um, Absolutely. that's about it for big moves. Although there is one more big move that's expected to happen. Uh, Lamarcus Aldridge's yep. contract has officially been bought out by the Spurs. They showed their hands too early. They admitted that they were going to buy his contract out if they didn't trade him. So no team was going to trade for him. They were just yep. going to wait for them to buy it out. Um, so the Heat are expected to be front runners. I, I don't really see anybody else pursuing him. The Lakers no. maybe, but um. Yeah, see, I think I think you can expect to see maybe by the end of this weekend or next week that Aldridge will be on the Heat. Um, mm-hmm. He's been linked there for a while. In terms of the Lakers, I would um, I would expect them to go after Andre Drummond in the bio market. Right. Yeah. And uh, if they can somehow land Andre Drummond, that is that is huge. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally yeah. and figuratively. But um, yeah, back to brain freeze who who who's... Uh, aldridge aldridge uh yeah he's been linked to the heat for a little bit i think you know when when the you know the the rumors officially got out about DeRozan and um aldridge moving on from the spurs or the spurs moving on from them um the heat have already been the heat have been linked to both of them at once but mm-hmm. mainly aldridge so it, it's kind of just written in the stars right now and i think you can expect to see that um i don't think any team I don't think any team will approach him to the extent that the Heat are going to, if they haven't already. Right. Like at this point, I think he's already officially bought out. So the Heat are already on his phone right now or talking to his agent right now, letting them know this is what we're going to pay you. Um, The Heat, despite being a seventh seed, got a lot better through the trade deadline. I think, I think they put themselves in a position to get back to the finals if they want to. Sure. It's a tough road. It is with Philly, Milwaukee, and Brooklyn up there at the top, but yeah. they can do it. I think I think they just definitely secure themselves a chance to do that. Absolutely, and yeah, you know, a team that made the finals last year improved their roster, so yeah, they're expected. Anything outside of that would be considered, you know, a failure. And you know, obviously, I think people want to call this Brooklyn team a super team, but you know, we haven't seen them all together yet, and we haven't seen them in the postseason, so. You know, to just give them the East, I think, is very premature. But mm-hmm. it's I think it's definitely right. It's the the Heat are the reigning Eastern champs, and it will continue to go for them. And especially now, if they – the moves they made yesterday and on top of if they can pick up Aldridge, it's just going to make it more – it's going to make it more tough of a road. You know, and if Brooklyn can get – if the Heat can get Brooklyn before the conference finals, that would be also huge. So mm-hmm. it's, it's also going to be very – it's um, – a big role that's going to play in all of this is the seedings, the matchups. So that's something to keep an eye on. And it's so tight in that conference right now. So it can change from day to day. Yeah. If you're looking at Brooklyn, you have to take into account that Kyrie Irving just took some time off to go handle some family matters in the middle of the season. And and this is months after we had the same exact issue or a very similar issue happen earlier this season. Yeah. So like, like Kyrie Irving is not reliable to show up on any day. And he could... why? What is? Uh, keep yeah. And on top of that, as you was not to interrupt you, but Durant, what? Why hasn't Durant played? Mm-hmm. I I don't understand. Um, people can say he's resting, but you don't rest someone three fourths of a season. You just don't do that. And that makes me think. You know what is going on? And I don't know if they're trying to hide. You know. I don't think they're on the brink of disaster, but what is like, you got to wonder what the front office is thinking that, you know, it's always one. It's never those three together. It's never if, you know, Katie's hurt or, you know, if Katie's on the verge of coming back, Kyrie, you know, Kyrie leaves and, you know, no one knows what he's doing. Um, Yeah. You can say Harden's been a consistent player. He's been awesome on Brooklyn, but, you know, he flat out quit his way out of Houston to get traded to this team. So, you know, 
I'm not coming at him as a person, but you know, these three personalities together on is that's extremely difficult to maintain on top of egos. So, you know, it looks pretty right now, but you just don't know, you know, you don't, it's not the Warriors where you, you don't have quiet guys who just want to win like Curry and Clay Thompson. And, you know, they took, you know, they took kind of a back seat to Kevin Durant, Kyrie and James Harden. That is the, the they, they, in terms of personality and play style, they may be the complete opposite of those two. Right. So, yeah, it looks awesome on paper, but you know, you got it's easier said than done. So, I'm not willing to just say the league's over right now or the East is over. I think it still runs through the heat. Although, it is worth noting, despite I don't think I think we've had like three games with all three players healthy and on the field and on the court. They're still 30 and 15. They're still the three seed right now. Despite yeah. all this dysfunction and despite all the yeah. unorganization, they're Absolutely. still the three seed in the East. Like I, it, yeah. it makes me wonder what can they do if they all get on the court, but also can we get them all on the court, please? Exactly. Exactly. And you know, in NBA regular season, you can get by if you have that talent, but come playoff time, when you're in a seven game series, it's going to take more than that. So you're absolutely right. Right. And, and for some reason, I cannot mentally imagine a proper travel with those three. Like, like I feel like they're going to do really well in home games and yeah. then just flounder in a way and play with a lot of games. You don't know what Kyrie is thinking. You just have no clue. Mm -hmm. Like, you, like everyone, like, they could be up 2-0 in a series. They're all getting on the plane. And, and the vibes could be wrong. Kyrie needs to stay. They're looking out their plane window and they see Kyrie driving away somewhere. Like you just don't know. You just don't know. What's happening. Right. Right. It's just, it's really concerning. Um, of course they're not buyers or sellers come to market because yeah. they have no money. They don't no. And you when, know, when you paid the three, three of the best players in the league, you have no money anymore. It's title of bus for this team this year because right. It's going to be extremely, extremely challenging to come back next season with this exact roster on top of Blake Griffin. I, I still don't, I don't understand that either, but you know, obviously players are just players want to ring and they, you know, they want, look, they if they need, if they need depth, I'm sure you can get Vince Carter out of retirement for one yeah. more run. Yes. Um, they'll, they'll sign Ray Allen too. At this point, well, I saw a, a joke tweet. Uh, I actually think it's Trenton Corn, one of our writers here at Porterfield. Yes. Uh, yeah. The sh or I forget who he said, but they're interested in Charlotte Hornets owner Michael Jordan to come out of yep. retirement and sit on yep. the bench. <laughs> Probably. I mean, yeah. Who knows? Who knows what's next for them? But um, that that's about it for today's episode. Uh, there's a lot of great moves for the NBA. It's going to be interesting for a lot of those young teams moving forward. It is That's what the trade deadline was. It was young teams getting better. And I think that just this past week made the future of the NBA better. Yeah. You know, it when the Lakers finally stopped being the Lakers, because yeah. we all know LeBron's going to play until he's 80. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. When, when they stopped being it, you know, the question was always going to be, well, who's next? Who's the yeah. league's – who's going to have the league in their hands now? Any team could take it now. Yeah, it's very important, especially for a league like the NBA, that they have multiple, you know, great teams. Uh, it creates parity, you know. It, was, it wasn't it was fun when the Warriors had their team, you know. You, mm -hmm. you, 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 you know, you sit all day, you eight months through a regular season in the playoffs, you just know how it's going to end, you know. Now, you know, you know, we still might get like, you know, a fairly predictable finals, you know, Lakers, Nets, Heat, Lakers, you know, or maybe even, you know, Clippers, Denver, whatever. Those are considered the top teams. But, you know, for years moving forward, there the East is going to be wide open. And as of now, the West is too. And we haven't even mentioned how, you know, how great Utah has been. Utah and Suns. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. I think it's very important that what the East did yesterday kind of gaining ground on the West in terms of parity, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, I think it, I think it was a, I think it was a very successful day overall in terms of the future for this league. Now all the NBA has to do is finally put some of these younger, less 
mainstream teams on television. I agree let, let us watch some of these teams. I wrote, or I, I think I talked about it in No BS at the beginning of the season when they put yeah. out the opening day and Christmas Day uh, schedules. It was all yep. Lakers, Bucks, yep. Nets, Knicks. It's like these are the teams we see over and over again. Yeah. Like the Suns weren't even on Christmas Day. And they are the team right now. They're the team everyone everyone talked about in the bubble. Yeah, I think that I agree with you. I don't think they should run away. I don't think – I think the NBA can, like, you know, I don't think they have to jump out right away and make all of these marquee TV matchups, you know, eight, you know, four months before the season starts. I think you should look at how teams start, the rosters, take all of that into consideration, and then plan these games. It's sort of like the NFL. Like, you see later in the season of an NFL season, you know – teams you know a sunday night matchup that looking at the schedule before the season was going to be a great matchup but either one or both of those teams underperform and they flex it to you know a matchup with two teams that are playing great that we didn't expect to have a prime time game the nba should take a similar you know approach to that if it's say a team you know uh i i hate to keep bringing up boston but you know if you, no one, you know, Celtics, Knicks, Boston versus New York, you know, the NBA is going to look at that and want to put that on ESPN before the season just because of the brand. Mm -hmm. But that is not a game that's going to draw a big crowd as opposed to, you know, someone looks at the schedule and sees Suns Jazz. That's not, you know, oh, oh my God, I can't miss that. But now that is one of the better matchups in all of basketball. So they should, I think they should take a similar approach to, you know, flexing games like the NFL does. Right. And it's worth noting later in the season, they do tend to do that. They don't yeah. announce the times of their matchups. And then yeah. as, like a day or two before they'll announce, okay, this is, this is our prime time seven thirty yep. game. Yep. Um, it, it is worth noting the NFL. Like I know we talked about NBA all day, the NFL with their new broadcasting deals gave themselves yeah. even more ability to do that with flexing. They can flex Monday night football now. Oh man. They are we're going to get good Monday night games finally. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to be spoiled. Right, be like, like my big complaint all throughout the season was there were no good primetime games. And it feels like now, with the exception of Thursday night football, Thursday night football is going to continue to be a garbage fire because it's it's four, day, it's four days of work in between yep. your last game and that game. It's going to continue yep. to be bad. But every other primetime game is going to be fantastic. Absolutely. Not to mention, you know, they're on the verge of adding that 17th game. So we're going right. to get another game. Right. Um, so, and also, I, I know I just dished on Thursday Night Football, but the, it's going to Amazon. So it's no longer going to be Fox commentary. It's going to be this whole new commentary team. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, will you please hire Pat McAfee to do that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, like, like, I'm super excited for the NFL's new season, um, even if the Chiefs are very disappointing thus far in the offseason. Oh, yeah. You know what, though? They, as long as they have that quarterback, they will be right. in it. They will be right. in it. It's it's the LeBron James effect. I, <laughs> you know, we can talk about NFL in a couple weeks or whatever, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think, I think Chiefs fans have a right, you know, to be a little concerned with the lack of moves they made, but uh, I think they're still in a significantly better position than a majority of the league. Right. But that about wraps it up for today's episode. Um, Donovan, why don't you tell the people where they can find you? Yep. Uh, my Twitter is at DunnyKaz, D-U-N-N-Y-K-A-Z. Um, a lot of exciting stuff moving forward with Borderfield. Um, keep track of all our shows, podcasts, all of our amazing writers, and um, we'll see you guys in a few weeks. Right. And then you can find all of our writings, all of our podcasts, all of our shows online at BorderfieldSports.com. Um, we have a lot of great stuff coming in April and then an even better round of stuff coming in the summer. So we hope all of you go to check that out. And until then, we will see y'all next week. See you guys.